Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, I am talking with Nicholas. I believe it's pronounced Corvesis, right? Okay. Yes. I, I always ask everybody how to pronounce their name on, like, because I always, if I get it wrong, and I feel like an idiot. So, today, we're going to be talking about, like, marketing uh, slash SMMA, social media marketing and everything, um, how, you know, the trials and tribulations of your business, how you can, you know, get better with getting results for clients. There's all these different things that have to do with having your own agency. And then if you are, you know, happen to be a business owner or something like that that is watching this, maybe you can implement a little bit of strategies yourself or maybe reach out to one of us to see if we can help you. Uh, I know I'm in the California area. I believe Nicholas is in the Florida area, I think. Is that right? Cincinnati. 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 Okay, why did I think? <laughs> I thought I saw a post on your Instagram about like uh, Fort I was, Lauderdale. I was... Yep, I was in Florida recently. Oh, that's so why. I, okay, <laughs> got it. Cool. Yeah, so if you're yeah, in yeah, Ohio, yeah. hit up Nick. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're just going to be talking about all sorts of stuff here because I have an agency for marketing and stuff like that, and so does Nick. Um, and yeah, we'll just generally talk about that. So the first question that I wanted to ask right away, Nick, is how you basically got into everything, what your um, experience has been so far, and just generally what type of clients you help out with. Just like, tell me about you and your business. Okay. Yeah, cool. So um, once again, thanks for interviewing me and having me on, on here. It's really cool, cool unique experience. But um, so I don't know how many of you know, I'm 18. I just graduated high school and I'm in college now. Um, I started maybe last year sometime. I got into drop shipping, honestly, off of YouTube. I saw oh, some YouTube no. videos. <laughs> yeah, I was in drop shipping. And oh, so man. I... I saw the value in it and I still do see the value in it, but it's not for me. Um, I don't really like drop shipping, mm -hmm. but I definitely see the value in it. And maybe eventually I would do a completely automated thing and hire people to do it for me, but mm -hmm. it wasn't for me. So then I got off of that and then I saw some other YouTube videos on like social media marketing slowly, but surely I started watching them. And then eventually I was like, wow, this could be something that I could legitimately do. And then, um, I started getting more into it and kind of making a plan, figure out what I would do. And then I got a mentor from New York who's been really successful with all this kind of stuff. And then I self-taught a lot of it as well. He walked me through of it. And then from there, it's just been how it is now, just getting clients, closing sales, helping people grow, all of that good stuff. But that, that's basically how I started. There we go. That's kind of funny. You talked about drop shipping, which on a side note, I actually do think that like if you're going to do e-commerce, probably Amazon FBA is the way to go because of like, the credibility. Yep. But it costs more money. And yeah, it's a little, it's kind of weird. It's odd. Um, I actually found on a, on a, another side side note, I found a different type of uh, business model for like Amazon F. Where it's not even really Amazon FBA. It's like you know how you have like the affiliate links for Amazon products. Yeah. What this person did was they set up a e commerce looking website, and uh, what they do is they put the pictures of the products and everything, and it seems like you're purchasing the products from that website. But then when yeah. you when you click on buy, it just goes to Amazon. <laughs> and I was like, that's that's, that's, that's pretty cool because like even if someone is like I don't want to say they're getting like duped or whatever, but like even if they do click on buy now and then it goes to Amazon, like they're not gonna not purchase. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, why would, why, it doesn't seem yeah. weird if it went to like some shady website maybe. But yeah, yeah. dude, drop shipping. Like I do want to get into that because I feel like a lot of people in like like or that are trying to get into entrepreneurship or like choosing between like drop shipping, SMMA, affiliate marketing, uh, you know, all this type of stuff. And sometimes I don't even like to call it SMMA because it's not just social media. It's kind of just like digital in general. That's a, that's what I call yeah. myself. I just call it digital agency. Yeah. But um, yeah. some, it's too many people focus on just the social media part when there's like website design you do and all this other stuff too. Um, yeah. But exactly. with drop shipping, I want to get into that a little bit. So what what were the major like bad things that you saw about drop shipping and like i guess cuz there are a few good things but what was like your experience with that before you got into uh marketing so with drop shipping like i said i saw the value in it and i still do for sure and what, what but, would be the value i mean it can be very automated mm -hmm. almost you really never have to touch it i mean a few updates here and there um updating products and whatnot I mean, basically, it's just very, very automated. Like, mm -hmm. it's just, and it's simple, like where you, it's, you could sit at home all day and do it. Yeah. Um, social media marketing or digital marketing, marketing in general, you can't necessarily sit at home all day mm -hmm. and just do something. But that, that's where I saw the value in it. And um, I started it and it was like somewhat working, not really, but I just didn't like it. 
I guess you could say, I guess I'm more of like a social person. So that's why I like digital marketing. And like, like you said, I don't really call myself a social media marketing agency. I more am shifting to call myself like a digital marketing, like growth expert or Mm. digital marketing growth specialist, because not just running Facebook ads or whatever, but just consulting them and how to grow their business and increase and stuff like that. But yeah. Yeah. Cool, yeah, because like a lot of the stuff that happens with drop shipping, drop shipping, in my opinion, is good if you know how to build a brand around your products to where it's yeah. like like movement, right? Like the watches yeah. and stuff that like yeah. at first were drop shipping and then turned into like more of their own products and stuff. But there's so many people that I feel like fall for the drop shipping scheme because the drop shipping scheme is different. Where they're like, oh, you know, you put in this much money and then you make. 10 times or something. It's like, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very different. Plus with Amazon and other e-commerce sites being so big and stuff, it's hard to compete with them sometimes, um, depending on what it is. But yeah, dude, it's just, it's, I see so many people just like fall in drop shipping and they think that they're going to be millionaires. And I'm just like, God, like, <laughs> why does this have to happen? <laughs> like so many people yeah. are getting screwed over, but it yeah. is what it is. But yeah, I mean like I never tried drop shipping. I considered it one time, but then I was like, I just weighed the pros and cons. I was like, uh, either I could sell like little products that like anybody can sell, like, and there's no uniqueness to it other than the Mm -hmm. brand that you kind of manufacture around it, which is kind of made up or actually help business owners get more customers and do something tangible. Like it just, you know, it's very clear. Um, yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's just a shame what happens in, in the drop shipping industry, but, um, that's good. So, with it your is. agency that you have right now, um, you were saying like you can't really sit at home and stuff like that. So how did you primarily get clients or what was your experience with that portion? Because, you know, there's like getting the clients and then doing the marketing and then keeping the clients and all that type of stuff. So what was the first part? So getting the clients is yeah. what you're asking me pretty much. Mm-hmm. So I use a whole bunch of different methods and but mainly I like being very, very personal with with everything that I do in my agency. So most of the time it's walk-ins. Okay. That is really where I get. And if you're an agency owner, you're looking to become an agency owner listening to this, walk-ins are probably, I think, one of the best ways to actually close clients because I still do it even though I'll still do like, like I'll still do cold calling and stuff. But for me, cold calling, people say it's like dead and whatnot. Um, I don't think so. I think otherwise, I think that you can use cold calling to get clients. But me personally, I use cold calling to practice like my skit, my skit skills. I go on there to practice, like we call people to practice selling and objections and just becoming more confident. And if I land a meeting, sweet, I land a meeting. I'm not going to complain about that, mm-hmm. but mainly walk-ins is where I get most of my clients. Okay. So when you, um, when you walk in, do you do like any preparation beforehand or is there, um, like a specific, like, you know, when to walk in so that the business owner, uh, is there or like kind of what's your preparation process? So this goes both ways. This goes with everything that I do. Um, when I walk in, I'll usually bring some kind of value to them, whether it's, um, it's like a free piece of information or something as simple was like a gift card to somewhere or a letter with a gift card in it, something like that, just something bringing them value in any way that I can that they would definitely appreciate. Um, and the main part of that is getting past the gatekeeper as with anything, no matter what means of, um, outreach you're doing. But my main thing, like I was saying is I never let them get away from me. So, and I never let them say, okay, let me think about it or let me schedule something. When I go in there, I'll usually, they say, Hey, the owner's busy, whatever. I'll always ask them what's a better time that I can come back. And I'll suggest times to them. I'll make sure that I get a very specific time when to come back. Same with calling a very specific time to call or come in. So I don't lose them. Um, and honestly with preparation, pretty much it's either preparing some kind of value for them or, um, getting ready to make sure I can follow up with them again Got and it. being very genuine and just be- being very genuine and kind and whatnot to, to get through. Got it. Yeah. Like the main thing that I feel like holds, you know, pretty much everyone back is like the gatekeeper. Cause if the gatekeeper wasn't there, it'd be pretty easy to talk to the owner. Right. But like, yeah. so if the gatekeeper was to say like, what are your objection handler for some of the things they could say? Cause like you said, if they're not there right now or the owner's busy, you say, you know, what's the better time to come back so I can tell them about basically the value that I can give them. But what if they, you know, say stuff like, 
you know, oh, we're just not sure. It's kind of an all over the place schedule because, like, I got that a couple times um, where, yep. you know, you walk in there and you're like, okay, are they usually here at, like, the afternoons or evenings? And, like, they tell you and then, like, which day? And then they just won't give you, like, a good time. Um, what would be your, like, solution for that? So my solution for that and what I do is – I'll honestly be very, very persistent and everything. So if the first time I go, say I walk in and they say what what you said, they're like, oh, the schedule's up in the air. I'll just ask them again. Okay, well, if you were to guess, what's one time that you think I could come back in, walk in just one time? And then you always got to suggest times to them because they'll never really be sure. So you should Mm -hmm. just maybe like, hey, how about like right before you guys open or right after you guys close or something? How would that work? Like, I'm sure he has time. Like, and you even tell them like, hey, I just want to get his opinion on this. I want to get the owner's opinion on this. I really believe that it could help out their business, and it's my passion to help out your business. And if they're still saying no, they're still saying no, and they still just don't know, you say, okay, no problem. Um, I'll be sure. And then you tell them, okay, I'm going to stop by this time, this time. And then you ask them for an email or a phone number that they, you can use. And then what I do is usually our, literally directly after that, I'll walk back, sit in my car. I'll send them an email right off the bat. Then I'll go home and then the next day or whenever, I'll just go back consecutively. Persistence is very key. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what I do. And with persistence, if it's not after the first, second, third time, I'll definitely get a meeting after persistently going for like a week straight. (laughs) Nice. There you go. Have you ever gotten, um, like when you ask for the email and the phone number or whatever, do they ever, like the gatekeeper will say like, we're not supposed to give that information out? Or like, what if they won't give you that information to email them? That honestly has not happened to me yet. Um, I've always gotten emails. Um, I've never of the had owner directly or just kind of like not, the general. Yeah, not of the owner directly, but I've gotten it from the owner directly. I usually ask just of a general thing just so I can get in their ecosystem. Email mm-hmm. obviously is the worst way I think to <laughs> actually get get to people. But I mean, just to get in their ecosystem and it shows that I'm persistent because I can always bring it up in later conversations like, hey, I emailed you this, this and this. And when I email them, I won't just send them like, yeah, hey, I stopped and I'll give them value once again in the email. Mm-hmm. Even if they don't necessarily look at it, and I know, I go and when I send the email, I know they're probably not going to look at it. I'm not counting on them to look at it. Mm-hmm. But I still send it to them nonetheless. Um, but no, I've never had them say no to me. I'll ask for the owner's email, and if they say no, then I'll just go to like the kind of general company email or phone number. Okay, got it. Yeah, because I've definitely had that a couple times. Like all the, you know, all the trials and tribulations, I feel like we've all gone through with trying to get a hold of business owners because it kind of depends on the industry and stuff. Like if you're trying to go for like, you know, chiropractors and things, it's like super hard. But if it's like a realtor, like usually they're pretty easy to get a hold of. Yep. Um, yeah. But do you have a, like a niche or industry or anything that you go to? Because as of right now, I don't. And I don't see myself putting like doing like a niche or industry. So I would say yes and no to that question. So I specialize more in healthcare. So dentists, chiropractors, plastic surgeons, all that good stuff. But I'm not going to push anyone away. I've worked with, and I currently still do work with, like air um, air conditioning companies. Like they install air units and heating, uh, car repair shops, realtors, um, all that good stuff, restaurants um, and stuff like that. So I work with everyone, but my specialty is healthcare, and that's mainly what I go for because they're more high ticket, obviously. Um, and I really like seeing the results because not as many people could say that they've brought in maybe like. 33 leads for a dentist compared to like 33 leads to a restaurant. Mm-hmm. I like showing like those results. I think it's, it's amazing. Yeah, true. Yeah. Cause like right now I'm, it's, I'm similar. I usually go for like, you know, more professional services. They can afford it just kind of like, um, yeah, like lawyers, doctors, all that type of stuff. Um, but I mean, maybe down the road I'll kind of specialize a little bit more, but as of right now, it seems like or, you know, it kind of seems like most businesses have a very similar, you know, structure of getting them clients. It's like, what problem do they solve? And what, who are you going to put that in front of? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it's pretty simple. For sure. So I feel like too many uh, people try to put themselves like a niche or an industry too much, Uh, especially the people that sometimes have uh, like the name of their company. Like when they make an LLC or something like that, they'll be like landscape marketing or something. And I'm like, Oh God, yeah. like it's just so cringy. I don't like that. It, Cause I'm yeah, like, and it, it, it restricts you. Yeah, too. It puts like you in a if box. you were to ever want to change. Yeah, exactly. If you were to ever want to change it, it sucks. I think That's I would laugh sure. so hard if I was a business owner and then like, I was like a realtor and then all of a sudden landscape marketing guru <laughs> came up to me and I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's so funny. But yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> 
it's kind of funny. It shouldn't be funny, but it is funny to like see people kind of go through all this entrepreneurship stuff and then like kind of fall down <laughs> a couple times. But yeah, they do get back funny. up. There are some people that have like names like that though, like landscape marketing, and they have like twenty thousand dollar a month businesses or something that somehow ended up working with different people that have nothing to do with landscaping. <laughs> so it is kind yeah, of funny. But okay, so yeah, when you walk into the clients, you should make sure to be persistent and to um, make sure that you're trying to get the right information from them. But over time, because you're in front of them so much, you're kind of counting on that the other people that anybody else that would be contacting them wouldn't be as that, you know, as persistent. So you really have their attention. So that, yeah, that and also I bring very unique value. I can't talk, well, I bring very unique value and I can't talk about like all the methods I use because my mentor taught them to me and it's very tight knit and a close community, but being very unique goes in a lot into it with no matter what you do, obviously. And when you're trying to get through to them, being unique is, is super, super important and it, and it works a ton no matter what you do. Got it. So very good. Yeah. I mean like the things that I usually stick with are, you know, like Facebook, Instagram, um, ads and then like Google, uh, Pinterest, LinkedIn, email, yeah. you know, like kind of like basic stuff like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, as far as like the marketing stuff goes, like, cause we'll transition to that a little bit more now cause you get the clients and then actually doing the marketing. So when yep. you, when you do the marketing, like what's your structure or your process that you usually follow that, um, helps you create effective ads or get results for people without, you know, revealing the, the methods that you're talking about. Yeah. So I'll, it, it pretty much works the same for all my clients, but I'll do, I'll use healthcare as an example because I'm more specialized in that. And there's a little bit more that goes into it. And it's kind of unique and a little different in some ways. It could be, it could not, but I think there is. So okay. I'll, I'll focus more on the healthcare side when I'm describing everything, okay. but you can apply this to any business, obviously. Mm-hmm. So for a dentist, for example, I'll run Facebook ads and, um, campaigns and whatnot, usually video ads though. I'll do picture ads, but video ads, VSLs are the main conversion point for all my advertising. No matter who I'm, this is for all businesses, it's not just dentists, like I said. Mm-hmm. Um, VSLs are the best. They convert the best. They don't even have to be very like, quote unquote, professionally done, mm-hmm. like movie quality. Um, just if they're genuine, unique, and they get the offer across because I'm sure you know as well, videos convert so much better than pictures. Could even do it on like an iPhone. (laughs) I do. I do do it on my iPhone. There you go. I I do it all on my iPhone. I edit it all. I mean, maybe eventually I'll upgrade, but as of now, I haven't seen the need to. Um, So I I do videos for that, for the first step. And then I'll obviously do some pictures here and there. The budget for those will be lower, but it's just, why not? Um, And then, so what I used to do is I used to do click funnels. So I would grab the lead from the video or picture. They'd click the link, shoot them over to ClickFunnels and put their information. I'd get their information. One other, some upsells, downsells on the page on the back end, whatever, mm-hmm. how to get their information. It'd send over to the doctor. They'd have to call to make sure to follow up. So now that can work and it does work very well, but specifically with healthcare and dentists, um, it doesn't work. It does not work at all and it will never work. It could work a little bit here and there, but in the long is it run, because it the not... office isn't following up or yes, that's part of it. That's a huge problem with it. And I'm actually like this, like last month I figured all this stuff out. It's crazy. There's so much problems with it. Like the more like healthcare marketing side of the community. So mm-hmm. now what I do, which is different to that is I'll do the same thing with the video ads and whatnot, but instead of click funnels, I'll do it straight on a Facebook lead form. Mm-hmm. So, and from there I have automation set up where the new customer will get an email but more importantly, a text message following up saying to do all this stuff. And it'll come usually every other day for quite some time until they come in. And then also, um, with my clients, all my clients, I have a shared Google document where all the client, all the new patients or new potential clients would be, uh, populated in instantaneously upon opting in. Mm -hmm. Also, I get a text message to make sure everything's working. My clients get an email to make, to get the leads. Then from there, they follow up. I train almost all my clients on like sales and whatnot. And if you're a business owner watching this, definitely recommend training your, your no matter what business you're in, training your team in sales 100%. and everything. And it may not, as it may not seem you're in the sales, like I can't think of an example right now off the top of my head, but you may not think that you're in the sales um, 
business, but you are. If you're in the people business, you're in the sales business, and everyone is in the people business because you're always trying to sell people. Even if you don't own a business, you're trying to sell yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going for a job interview, all that good stuff, you're yep. always trying to sell yourself. Even if you're trying to convince your friend to give you to give you your phone, to give you their phone to like call your mom or something. Yeah. You're, you're selling yourself all the time. So I always recommend that. And I train my clients, sales team, receptionists and all that. And that's where the problem comes in is follow up. You have to make sure you have to strenuously push that on the receptionist all the time. Because a lot of people don't think how entrepreneurs think and they don't think, okay, follow up. Like new lead, like they jump on it right away. They don't. And mm -hmm. I always use the analogy of like you're going to the bathroom. So if you're sitting down, you're a receptionist or whatever, and you're filling out paperwork, you're doing what a receptionist does, and you have to go to the bathroom, you get up and go, you can stop. So I tell them, hey, when a new lead comes in, treat it like you got to go to the bathroom. A new lead comes in, just stop what you're doing, call them, and then you're done. That's um, funny. Yeah. So, I mean, because it's hard. They don't like to, I guess, I don't want to like bad fashion receptionist but like some of them don't like doing more work than they're already doing mm -hmm. um especially when they don't understand it so usually i'll try to implement some kind of paying for them whether that, i usually do it through the doctor um like pay them a little up front for actually scheduling the appointment and mm -hmm. pay them a little bit more on the back end for actually getting them in um as a new patient um other than that that's that's pretty much my marketing strategy there's a little bit other more extensive in detail stuff um, and also if, once again, if you're a business owner watching this, um, when I'm consulting them almost probably 90, 95% of the time I make them raise their prices on all of their services. Um, cause it, it'll convert better. If, for example, if you had maybe say, I'll just use small numbers, say you had implants that cost 500 bucks and you want to get, take off like 10%, 25 bucks or whatever, it doesn't look as good. So I'll tell them, hey, you need to take $500 off your implants. They're like, well, it costs that much. I always tell them, double your prices. It looks so much better. Because um, then if you see $500 off Invisalign, or two, because usually what I'll do is $2,000 off implants. And it just, just works a lot better, and I always consult them that way. So basically, that, that's how everything I do works. Got it. Cool. Yeah, like with the, with the same thing, like you got to, yeah, you got to incentivize the um, – potential customer to actually like schedule something. So sometimes yeah. on like a thank you page, I'll like, you know, prompt them to do that or something or call the business right away. Um, just to kind of avoid that whole having to follow up with like, you know, the reception is having to follow up with them. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you got, you, you're right. You do have to give some type of incentive for them. And what I've seen certain business owners do is they just hire another person as like an inbound or outbound specialist. Um, that that's like yep. all they do, <laughs> but I like yeah. that, that you train the, uh, the team on how, how they should basically do everything and you don't just leave it up to the business owner to relay that to them. You know what I mean? So that's pretty good. And then as far as yep. like them yep. retaining nice. clients and stuff like that, it sounds like you grab the email address and the phone number, which is awesome. And then, um, creating marketing campaigns down the road as well as like retaining customers to make sure that, you know, like if they, cause the, the whole point is, you know, to make sure that you have like a lower uh, incentive offer so that they'll come in and then you kind of upsell and make sure you make your money on the back end. But then to do like the LTV and everything like that, to see like what your customer is worth over time, you have to kind of calculate how long they're going to come in for and then you hope to retain them. Do you usually do that over email or text message or do you just have them call them manually that maybe like six months later or how do they, how do you usually like do like ongoing stuff you know, so, a month later? So how do I keep them as clients? How do I keep the new potential customers as clients forever? For the business owners, yeah. For the business owners. So this is what I learned recently as well. Um, for example, in healthcare, lifetime value necessarily doesn't exist in the healthcare industry because if you think about it, say you want to go get Botox, you're not going to go get a free trial Botox before you get it. You're just going to go pay 20 grand for a Botox, right? You're not going to go like get like a free trial of something else. You just go straight for it. Same with dentists, chiropractors, whatever. You're not going to get a, a trial version of something. You're just going to go in and get it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the raising of the prices come in. If you think about it, you have a more serious client if they're investing. If, if you're offering something for free, they're not going to be as prone to show up because it's free. It's 
there's no really you're they don't really have any skin in the game if it's if you're offering something that's two thousand dollars off and they still got to pay a thousand dollars they're going to be more committed and the leads that you're going to get are more effective um also what also i've seen and what i kind of implement and i tell the business owners i tell them to think about it like this that their lowest costing lead and um to preframe this a lot of people say like oh what's my lowest cost per lead all that good stuff what I'll usually tell them when that happens, I'll say that, I'll say like, listen, usually your lowest costing lead is usually your highest costing customer and your higher costing lead is usually going to be your lower costing customer, if that makes sense. Because a lot of businesses are like, I want like my highest, I want like lowest cost per lead, but if you think it's more about uh, quality. So if you're paying super little for a lead, once again, this is more healthcare. It's still in general as well though. Like you can apply it everywhere. If you're paying two cents for if you're paying like two cents for a lead that's a super cheap lead but who knows how long they're gonna stay because they're so cheap who knows all that stuff you know what i mean yeah if you're paying would you rather pay that or would you rather pay 20 bucks for a lead but they're a lifetime customer 50 bucks or 100 bucks even more for a lead but then they're a lifetime so i usually tell them that and they're like oh okay that makes sense when i explain them and they understand yeah um that that's how that works Got it. Yeah, no, that completely makes sense. And for a second, when I when I thought you were uh, going to say was your lowest uh, cost per lead or whatever was your current customers, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you could like <laughs> take your cur- uh, current customer list and like remarket to them or something. But um, no, that's actually, a, I like that. That's a good bullet point to say for like meetings and everything is just because it's a lower cost doesn't mean it's better. Like, you, yeah, you should go for the quality. Um, yeah, definitely, especially in like healthcare <laughs> or uh, anything like professional services, like lawyers and stuff for restaurants or like kind of lower ticket items, you'd probably wouldn't care what the cost per lead is. Cause it's like, they're going to, people are going to have to eat. <laughs> so like, it's yeah, fine. They, they come and go. I mean, yeah. they could be lifetime, but, and I'll sh- actually to touch on that now a little bit, a marketing aspect of it, just a little bit. So just so I can differentiate between both healthcare and then in general mm-hmm. for in general, I'll usually do like a three tier offer where there's like a huge giveaway, say like free, a free meal for a free breakfast for the rest of the entire year. I do a second offer, which is like 50 bucks off a meal, one meal. I'll do another offer, like a free ice cream when you come in, like and use this coupon. And so this is more like restaurants and whatnot, smaller businesses. And when they opt in for the, when like hundreds and hundreds of people will go for that free breakfast for a year, only one person will win though, but all those other people immediately get funneled to the next offer, which is 50 bucks off dinner, which is great it works super super well especially when it's i usually implement it in a text marketing campaign they all get funneled into that offer and it works really well got it okay so you do uh do follow-up text where they get that offer do you also do email and retargeting ads for that second offer too yeah okay yes i do i'll also do email and retargeting ads and uh also i wanted to say this too um when you were asking if i retargeted some or remarketed to some current clients or current patients or current customers I do touch on that a little bit with them um, because when I'm like teaching their team, I, I teach them how to upsell a little bit. Very ba- basic but effective stuff. Like I won't go too in depth with them, but mm-hmm. I'll teach them like basic upselling, how they can upsell their current clients and current patients and whatnot. I'll touch on it a little bit and I'll obviously help, depending on how what we're doing together, I'll obviously help their um, like email lists and whatnot, tell them how to make them more effective and all that good stuff. Awesome. Nice. Okay, so you were saying with all those strategies you're talking about with like the texting and emailing and everything, you're going to create the lifetime customer. Now, is the lifetime customer going to be able to get ads for the rest of time or is it like you're you're putting them through maybe like a two to three month process and then that customer just kind of just hand it off to the business owner and they're, they're the ones that kind of turn them into a lifetime customer, if that makes sense. So, uh, let me like, make sure I understand. So like, yeah. So if you get like, if a customer comes in from an ad and then they, yep. uh, maybe they don't show up or something like that. And then they finally do show up, um, and they, they do business with them and everything. Maybe that process takes like a couple weeks. Um, mm-hmm. and then maybe, you know, after they do business with them one time, they might get like another one or two retargeting ads within the next like month. But then after that, like how long are you doing like advertisements for with, uh, the so yeah if if a customer converts how long are they seeing ads for basically like any like retargeting ads or anything yeah it it depends 
Um, once they once they come in, usually I'll stop retargeting them with some ads um, because okay. when when I want I want them to come in. I mean, I'll still retarget them here and there, even if they're still current customers. Um, I can still have them get them. Sometimes I'll even do it on purpose just to show um, that like the business that they're working with is like serious. Because mm-hmm. if you think about it, it could be kind of weird. Maybe if you went and bought from somewhere. And then, like, you never hear of them yeah, ever. Yeah, that, that's what I was saying. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, once so, they... <laughs> that would be funny. Almost on purpose, it, it would be really weird. Almost on purpose, I'll give... I'll, but it won't be necessary. It could be a video ad, but not necessarily. But And most of the time, I'll make sure to tell the business owner to... It's, it's, once, my job is getting them in and making sure that they stay and to make them stay the business owner really has to focus on that by selling himself and selling his business Mm. Uh, but yeah no i'll definitely and then oh yeah that's what i was saying too i funnel the new patients and new whoever into the business owner's facebook page i also help with like facebook content instagram content so then even if for some reason they didn't see an advertisement they'd see all this great content on their facebook page and sometimes i'll put like the videos um video vsls on the person's facebook page on the client my client's facebook page for the customers to see but i always make sure to put like new patient special new customer special so sometimes i'll do it sometimes i won't just to make sure like they see us or see the, the, the business it. yeah and i remembered the question from earlier so i my, my little brain fart that i had um <laughs> so how much in ad spend do you usually recommend for a business owner total because you were talking about like you know three tier campaigns and each of those is going to have like a daily budget usually um so like what total amount of money per month do you, do, do you recommend they start with? And then once they get some results, what should they go to? For um, so like specifically for my agency or that I well, like kind of I charge or just in general? Uh, I guess both. Cause like for me, okay. I recommend it at least like $20 a day, AKA 600 bucks a month in ad spend, um, for anyone to like start out. Yeah. That's, Honestly, that's about the same with me. I mean, I'll, I'll start them just in general. If I'm like, if someone asks me that kind of question, like, "Hey, how much do you think I should put in ad spend?" I honestly tell them like five, six hundred bucks a month. Like, mess yeah. around with it, feel it out a little bit, because um, it's it's a lot of it is testing, as you know. So, but yeah. I usually tell them like, "Hey, feel it out with like five, six hundred bucks a month. See how it works. If it works, great. Keep it. Maybe even push it up more. Get even better results. If it doesn't work, push it up." maybe something's wrong with your offer, um, and whatnot. But yeah, usually five, 600. Um, and what I like to do. Yeah. Yeah. Five, 600. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Cause I think the thing that I see with, you know, people that I work with a lot is like, they'll have kind of major problems with their ads. Like either the offer will be bad or like they're not spending enough in the budget or like just the creative is terrible or like, yeah. so mostly what I see most of the time is the, the targeting ad copy and creative. Like the, they're usually fine with the budget and the offer might be like, okay, but like Sometimes I'll just be scrolling through my Facebook feed and just I reach out to the business owners that pop up in my feed because they're usually so like bad. Like I'll get like the ad copy will be like like literally like one sentence of like once in a lifetime experience and then the picture is just like some random picture and then like the offer says like free something and I'm just like what like it just looks so bad <laughs> and I reach out to it. but like I always try to be polite though and respectful and I reach out to them and I'm just like Hey, so I'm just wondering, like, do you do your own ads or do you outsource them? Cause like, dude, if I, if I saw one of those ads and like, <laughs> I, I got a response that was like, cause to this day, I have not got a response that it's, it's being outsourced from, a um, another, uh, marketer or anything like that. And I'm like, yeah, I had a feeling in the back of my head. I'm like, I got a feeling you're doing your own ads. Um, but it, it's just super funny. Cause if they, if it was another marketing company, I'd be like, Oh my God, like you're wasting so much more or money. But, um, yeah, like I've been really reaching out to a lot of those in my own yeah. Facebook feed because, and sometimes it'll just be super weird. Like their targeting will be way off. Like some like senior care thing might reach out to me and I'm like, dude, I'm super young. Like uh, even my Why mom, even my mom doesn't need senior care yet. Like, come on now. Um, <laughs> and, and she's a little older. So it's like, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. But so cool. As far as like retaining the clients and everything, you kind of give them a couple ads after, um, and then email and text follow up. Have you, I've text is a lot more effective than, than email for sure, but, for sure, um, yeah. kind of a random 
odd question is like, how do you make sure, <laughs> like one thing I'd be struggling to do with texting or like have been is like trying to fit everything in the text message. You know what I mean? Cause you only get like 140 characters. Yeah. Um, what is it like an average text thing look like for you? And you usually do like a follow up with the um, client's business. So it's really short and sweet. And usually even on the Facebook lead ad, this is more like a psychological trigger. Even on the Facebook lead ad, it'll say, do we have permission to text you this, this, or this. If they say no, they'll get an email, but usually like 80% of them will say yes. That makes it more of a qualified lead as well. Um, and then from that, usually it it's a check very short. Or do you, do you make, make them type in the word yet? Cause like it's a checkbox. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then after that, when they get it, like I said, it's very short and sweet. It's literally just like, Hey, you opted in recently for this offer, this deal. Um, please be sure to call so-and-so like, please be sure to call so-and-so to claim your offer. We want to make sure you don't miss out. Something similar to that. That's obviously you not fit all that in the text. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something like that. Very short and sweet though. Maybe not that long, yeah. but it's pretty much just like, Hey, you opted in recently. Make sure you call us now so you can, so you can receive your offer. P- pretty much that's it. Um, it. obviously it's not word for word. I, I honestly can't think of it. Off yeah. The I was about to head. say, I'm like, usually when I do like text offers and stuff for like, you know, business owners, it'll be something like super short. It'll be like free offer claim now call the, you know what I mean? Like it sounds yeah. like a caveman cause it's just so yeah. like, you're missing a bunch so. of words, but you got to fit it all in there. Um, yeah. but yeah, cool. And then, um, as far as retaining clients for you, um, cause like we're, what we were talking about with like ongoing marketing campaigns, like when you try to maybe switch it up, uh, for a business owner, cause you know, you can do a, an advertisement for you know, a pretty long time, but after a while, the people in the local area or whatever are gonna see the same ad over and over again, um, yep. if they haven't responded to it. So what do you do to usually consult with the business owner to kind of make the ads fresh or kind of switch it up a little bit? So I'll obviously always address their goals, what they want to accomplish and whatnot. I'll put that into account. Mm -hmm. But usually I don't use very many like offers, I guess you could say at a time for a dentist, for example, usually I'll do free imp, like not free. I'll do like, an just for an example, maybe an implant offer and maybe like a whitening offer. Mm -hmm. And I'll do that for a few months. And then like you said, when it runs out, we'll just switch it up to another service that he offers just throw a discount off of that or do a raffle okay. or something for free. So honestly, I just rotate. And then after that, so say like three months, I do a few, like two, three offers. Three months after, I do another two, three different offers. But then after that, I could honestly switch back and I've done it. I could switch back to, to the original. Like the, to the original too. Okay. Um, that, that's how I do it. But I, I don't like doing it. I like making it unique and whatnot and different. So I've never really ran out of options and we always like whenever I have a meeting with like my clients, we always like brainstorm a ton, think of like really good new ideas. I'm always learning more obviously. So I always come back. So I'll either have like biweekly meetings, sometimes even weekly meetings with my clients, but most of the time, like minimum, um, monthly meetings. And I mean, usually at the end of the month, when I come back, I always have fresh new ideas that I've learned that I can implement in, which is yeah. solid. Um, and funny, funny side note, when you were talking like how, you saw some ads and like if they were paying a ton to outsource, if you saw that, it would be really funny. Surprisingly, so I, I closed a, a dentist office recently and they were paying this marketing agency $4,000 for print advertisements. <laughs> and <laughs> wow. And, I, and I, I told them straight up, like I was trying to be really, really nice. And we had like built some of it a relationship. Like I could figure out what they were like, obviously. And they knew mm. what I was like. Like we were comfortable with each other at the point. Yeah. And I told them when they told me that, I was like, listen, I was like, I'm just going to be really honest with you because I want to see you guys succeed. You're wasting all of that money. Mm -hmm. I said, if you spent that with me, you'd get so much results. I said, even if you were to spend half of that with me, you'd get so much more results and so much more value. And and I said, listen, I, I don't even sometimes necessarily, I won't even charge you. I'll charge you less than half of that. Like, you'll get so much more results and whatnot. And Mm -hmm. I told them that and they were like, wow, they were like, and I showed them everything and they were sold. They were sold from the get go. The second I walked in and showed them just a few minutes of my stuff, they were sold, which is good. So I'm happy that I was able to help them out. And they're, they're canceling that contract soon, which which will be funny. (laughs) Yeah. Like I, uh, it's crazy how 
business owners sometimes just aren't aware, you know what I mean, of what's out there because yeah. you can't, you know, and you know this, can't track print ads or anything like that and nobody responds to that even more. People don't even respond to TV commercials anymore. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, it's crazy. It's just crazy. But um, something that is kind of interesting is if, so a lot of the questions that I'm asking, by the way, are for like the, the audience, not for me because I know most of the stuff. Yeah. But like, um, if a business owner doesn't believe in new, uh, like the new ideas of like marketing and everything, um, what I've done is basically just obviously case studies, testimonials, and then shown results, and then just explain to them the logic of where everybody's attention is at. You know what I mean? It's on yeah. social media, internet, phones, and everything. Is there anything additional to that that would kind of push the uh, uh, the business owner over the line to understand the value of digital and online? Um, I'd show them what their competitors are doing and if yep, I'll, it, yeah. I'll usually, yeah, I'll usually show them their competitors and if their competitors are doing it, they'll usually, that'll usually push them into like, Oh shoot, maybe I should do it. Yeah. I mean, some business owners, it's just impossible to convince them of it. They're just so old school. And then usually like if it comes down to it, like I've tried everything I can, I usually just won't work with them. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, pretty showing them their competitors is a big one. They usually get onto that and they're like, Oh dang. And they realize yeah, how important it is. I was about to like, I, how did I forget that one? That's actually part of my presentation. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, here's your top two competitors. And I mean, 90% of the time or eh, like 75% of the time, usually their competitors are doing some type of online marketing. So then yeah. I just show them, I'm like, well, these people are doing Google search ads, but you could be doing Facebook ads and Instagram ads that would be just as effective, if not maybe more effective because you're, it's client outreach. Like, you know, you explain all that. Yeah. But, um, no, that's pretty good. And then like, I just have a note on the bottom that says like, you know, not doing online could basically be costing your business like so much money because they're stealing all your customers. So that's true. That's pretty yeah. good. Random yeah. selfish question for Nick over here. Um, for me, how do you find the time to do, cause I, I'm pretty sure you're into like gym stuff and like working out a lot, right? Yeah. I go to the gym at once a day. Um, and morning, I usually morning or night? Um, I'm shifting more toward night, not going to lie. Yeah, because I, like, I can't I, – like I thought about doing the gym anymore, every morning because I wake up about like 8 because um, any earlier than that just makes me feel like really bad. So I wake up at 8, go to bed usually like 11 or 12. Um, but I'm thinking about doing more working out at like night just like with the busy schedule and stuff. But yeah. I'm not sure because they say that that's like not as good for you. Like you know what I mean? Like it's better because you, you get like amped up <laughs> like before yeah. bed and then like it's just kind of weird. But I don't know. They say morning is like better for your health and actual results. But I don't know. What do you think? So like I've done both. I've worked out like I've woken up like at 5 o'clock out of the gym at 6 and stuff. And I've worked out then. I've worked out at like 7, 8, 9. I've worked out in the middle of the day. Um, Like schedule wise for most people, nighttime – Late night, early mornings work the best. Um, but if like depending on what person you are, like you, you're more like nighttime. I'm, I don't know. Like I'm kind of both. But I think that nighttime's fine. I mean, uh, morning's great. It works. It's true that it could promote better results because like you wake up, the first thing you do is like grab a drink of water and just go hit the gym. Pretty much like maybe grab like a small snack, like just get some carbs in your body and then go hit the gym. Um, it's solid. But at nighttime, it it's not necessarily, from my experience at least, it's not necessarily true that like you'll be super amped up because as long as you do it right. So mm -hmm. say you go to the gym, you have a crazy hard workout, really good, you come back, and then if you stretch after your workout, whether it's at your house or at the gym, stretch, come back, take a shower, and then you just chill out for the rest of the night, it'll do just fine because it's good because then like your muscles are damaged obviously after you work out. Right after you work out, you stretch, come back, chill out for a few more hours, work, whatever, learn to whatever you got to do. And then you go to bed and your muscles recover. So I think honestly, either, or it just depends on you. I haven't really seen any hindrances in, in nighttime or morning. That That's my take on it. Got it. Okay. Cause I had another, uh, I had a fitness entrepreneur on here that's personal trainer and I was trying to ask him like tips for busy entrepreneurs on how to like, you know, basically get the gym in and he's like well you got to create a plan you got to schedule it and then you got to make sure yeah. you like stick to the plan and the like the nutrition plan too and everything and i was like yeah it makes sense so like after that uh call i was kind of like wow like it's actually not that hard to do any like workout stuff if you're a business person as long as you like structure it right but yeah um, you just gotta you just gotta make it something that like really matters to you like when i started working out 
I didn't really used to go. And then I pretty much forced myself to go like every single day. Mm. And now if I don't go on a day that I'm supposed to go, it feels like weird. Like I feel physically like weird if I don't go. So I feel like you just got to get yourself to that point and then you're good. Um, you just got to make it something that's important. That probably happened after like 90 days, right? Because that's like about how long it takes to do a habit. I'm guessing I was about to say that I'm guessing I was like younger than I was. Well, wasn't like younger, but I wasn't like, I guess I wasn't like consuming as much information and learning as much stuff. Now it probably was like 90 days if I were to think about it, mm-hmm. but that I, I don't really remember just is a little bit ago, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was 90 days. It's definitely formed into a habit. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, I get, I get that a lot where people are like, cause that's with anything. Like if you don't, if you don't run every day that are like people who are yeah. runners, they're like, something's off. <laughs> like I yeah, need to go it's to weird. It. That's cool. Okay. Selfish questions over back to other stuff. I was just wondering, cause I know <laughs> you did the gym stuff. Um, yeah. Do you have an LLC for your company? Because I do, and you, you know everybody usually recommends it. But are you sole proprietor by yourself at Corvestus Media, or do you have an LLC? So as of right now, I'm not an LLC. I'm a sole proprietor. Right. Um, I do have like a small team that works with me out of New York and here, and I outsource it to some like people that I know that I trust really well. Um, but right now, I'm a sole proprietorship. I told myself once I got like five clients, I'd go to an LLC, but that has not happened, and I have over five clients. So as of right now, I'm not an LLC. Like I said, I'm definitely going to transition very, very soon. But as of right now, I'm just a sole proprietorship. Got it. And then, Bo, by the way, if you want a tip. So um, if what I do for my clients, just like so because I know Square charges you like 3% or something like that for out of your money, right, that you get paid from that. Yeah. So if something um, like that. So I, if the client wants to pay by card, usually I have them do that as a processing fee just because, you know what I mean? Like, like they, yeah. they pay that, that portion. And then if, um, if they do a direct bank transfer, it is uh, free though. Like it's, there's no processing fee. So if you use QuickBooks instead of Square, okay. you can do a, um, you can have them enter in their bank information, which is just their routing number and account number. And okay it'll like, it's a free thing. So you don't get charged processing fees. So there's that <laughs> tip for you. Um, cause that's what I'll I look into that. Plus yeah. you can do a, uh, just like on square, you can do a recurring basis. Okay. So you cool. can do a recurring thing, uh, without them having to send them invoices. Cause that's annoying. And then, yeah. um, and then you don't like get charged processing or processing fee or anything. And then I think cool. QuickBooks is like 35 bucks a month and then that's it. Like you don't have to pay anything else. Plus when you get a transaction, it automatically does the accounting for you, which is pretty cool. Um, oh, wow. And then if you, if you connect your bank account, if you have an expense for like click funnels or something, it'll do all the accounting for you and you can just run a report wow. and then you go to your tax guy. So I use QuickBooks cause it's legit and it's the only, I thought, I thought Stripe did this, but it actually doesn't. QuickBooks is the only platform that lets you do free bank transfer on a recurring basis. I like wow. Stripe on Stripe. Oh, also, and you, uh, the, the problem with Stripe is you can't choose what day you want to build them on. So like if, if you guys sign the agreement on like the fifth, but they don't want to start the services until the 10th, if you put, if you put it into your Stripe thing that you can't pick the 10th as the day to start wow. on QuickBooks, you can choose what they want as their billing date. So it's legit. It's awesome. Um, I love QuickBooks, so you might want to use that, but, um, I'll definitely look into it. Cool. And then with, uh, so roughly how many clients do you have for your agency right now? About 10. 10. Okay. And then the majority of them are in the healthcare or is it kind of just spread all over the place? Majority of them are in healthcare, yes. Um, but I also have like that air company. I have like mm-hmm. some car guys. I have I the, the few other ones that aren't healthcare, but yeah, mainly healthcare. Got it. Okay. And then as far as because um, I know, I think uh, I always do like a quick check of everybody's Instagram to make like just figure out about them and stuff. With yeah. um, with you, you've helped train other people that want to be like marketers and stuff like that too. Do you have some type of I guess, what do you call it? Uh, program, like, program. Any, like any, you know what I mean? Or consultation calls or something, anything like that. I don't, I don't necessarily have a program, but I do consulting calls with people like on a daily basis. Um, you and you know, I'm not like, so that's all I was just about to say. I'm not all about the money. Um, I won't, it depends on what they want. I'll always have like a discovery call with them obviously. And I help them out like on a daily basis. Like this is one guy that I help out a lot all the time. 
And, you know, he hasn't paid me a thing. I don't charge him. I didn't even ask him once, but I give him like countless, endless value. Obviously not to the full extent that I could, obviously, mm-hmm. and not as much time because I'm starting with the more I get busier, it, it just doesn't work out that way. But mm-hmm. I do charge for the more extensive, in-depth, like very highly productive, crazy results. I'll charge for those. But for like, if you want like a consulting call, like once in a while, every, every day even and whatnot, I mean, I'll give it to it. Like, I'll, I'll give you value all the time. So, mm. yes and no. Yeah, I was kind of wondering. Like, I don't really – I don't fully believe in um, – like, so, yeah, with, with like, people on my personal brand that are, like, trying to get started out in marketing, I don't really want to do, like, a course for them because that's – you know, a lot of people do that. Yeah. Um, so, but I was trying to see, I was like, huh, I could do like consultation calls, but like, you know, yeah, like you said, giving away time for free all the time is yeah. hard. Um, because I mean, I want to help people, but the, the thing that really like kind of irks me about it is I feel like now before I was on this call with you, like I was telling you earlier, I was on a call with a guy that actually does seem to implement what I'm saying and like really takes in all the value. I give him a lot of stuff and he seems to be working towards it. Um, and then probably by the end of the year, he's going to be like, you know, more successful in it based on the stuff that I gave him, which is awesome. Yeah. But yeah. I feel like that's not 99% of people. And like, that's kind of the tough thing for me where I've realized I'm like, I probably should just charge for certain things like that, like regardless because I feel like if they don't pay for it, kind of like what you were talking about earlier with like the leads, like if they don't pay for it, they won't pay attention. You know what I mean? Exactly. And exactly. Like how I think about it too, I'll, I'll give people free value, but it's obviously not as great as paid. mm -hmm. And like exactly like you said, if they won't pay for it, they won't get value. Also, if you think about it, what would you feel of if you got a quote unquote, like next level high ticket consulting call but you're getting charged like 50 bucks for it or you're getting charged like, or it's free. Like, how would you feel about it? You probably wouldn't feel as great or your money's worth out of it. If you're maybe paying like a thousand, two thousand $2,000. Do you know who Dan Locke is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like he charges, like, I'm pretty sure now it's like 4,000 or like $2,000 an hour for consulting call. <laughs> or something, something like that. It's, it's like two, three, maybe even four grand an hour for a consulting call. And he told this guy this and the guy was like, I can't pay that. That's like, that's crazy. He's like, and the guy was like, do you do like any discounts or something? He's like, how would you feel if I gave you a discount on a high ticket call? It's going to teach you how to increase your sales. Like, what would that make me seem like if I gave you a discount or something like that? He'd be like, well, I probably wouldn't think you're as like legit. Yeah. And that's exactly how the same thing is with that. that. That's very true. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. But I think we pretty much went through everything like marketing related and also uh, dissing drop shipping a little bit. <laughs> uh, cool, cool. But yeah, I mean, I, I still think like, yeah, anybody that's watching this that wants to get into marketing, um, like it's a good idea because it's a win win relationship. Like you're helping business owners and then also, you know, they're helping you by paying you in exchange for valuable services. So exactly. And, and also on top of that, marketing and when, when you're going into I'll say social media marketing or you have a digital agency whatever I think those are skills that you'll develop and that you'll keep for a lifetime because marketing you can always use and apply it and when you're going into you're going to be once again selling selling your your services to people and if you get really good at selling and all that stuff you can apply that to whatever business you go to you'll be good at marketing you'll know sales you'll understand how to influence people it's something that sticks with you everywhere. And drop shipping, you maybe get. I'm dissing drop shipping. I didn't even realize. <laughs> Go it, ahead, but, man. <laughs> with drop funny. shipping, you're getting not some of those skills. You're maybe getting some other skills, but maybe not necessarily applicable to real life. Um, necessarily, not not as much as digital marketing and owning your own agency for sure. Because that's what I love about it. You can apply it to anything. If your business failed and just completely went crashing down you have all those skills still that you can easily give away to people i mean you can consult people i guess with drop shipping but i feel like that's not as valuable as if you were to consult someone on marketing advertising sales and all that good stuff because you can carry that stuff with you throughout life if even if the internet completely failed and blew up you'd still know how to sell people Mm -hmm. and all that good stuff so the funny thing is is like you know i funny enough like in my recommended videos and things like that on youtube it'll keep like all these people are starting to make videos now like that are like is 
is marketing or mar marketing agency or uh, SMMA or whatever like dead? Um, is it too saturated? All this type of stuff. And if anybody is watching this right now and they're wondering if like marketing uh, agency stuff is saturated, I'll explain it like this. There are tons of people doing it, but the amount of people doing it in comparison to the amount of people not doing it and they have no idea how to do it is actually like pretty small. Like it's a small little niche market of people that know about this stuff and of that niche market that know that are doing it. Uh, well, there's the people that know about it and then there's the actual people that do it. And then of the people that do it, I'd probably say like, 90% of them are really bad at it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Really? So yeah. yeah, like I've seen online or I mean, some of the YouTubers and stuff are like good at it. But like, again, that's only what, like 30, 40 people that are probably really good at it. And they have like high yeah. quality agencies, like the yeah. rest of the people that are their subscribers and everything that are doing it are just so terrible. They have no skills. They don't know how to get clients and anything like that. They can't actually get the client results, like just all this stuff. Yeah. And it's like, it seems like there's a lot of them out there, but the thing is, it's no comparison if you're actually a high quality agency, either like me or like you. So yeah, it's, for just, sure. it's just crazy to see sometimes when people are like, is it saturated? There's so many people doing it. I'm like, <laughs> not a lot of good people. I mean, yeah. it's, and, it's and even like if it, yeah, yeah. That, that's true. Realtors are a little different because it's like there's only like kind of one thing that they do. They just like sell your house or – Yeah. You know what I mean? Like or accept a sell. You know what I mean? Like there's not any like – I wouldn't say there's no uniqueness. It's still their service and how quick they can sell your home and things like that. But it's still a pretty uh, – There's it's only like one thing. You know what I mean? With what yeah. we do, it's like a plethora of all these digital marketing strategies that we can use. And you have to be like an expert in like all of them um, yeah. for it to be effective. But – I just think For it's sure. hilarious. <laughs> so, and I, I think even if it, one last thing on that, even if it, quote unquote, did ever get like super saturated, I think that you can still, with everything, you can still separate yourself from everyone else, make yourself unique, catch new trends on the topic, and apply it to your business. You can you can make your business better than other people. And a quick tip for that for anyone watching this, this goes for business owners as well as um, someone wanting to start their agency. If you constantly add value to your clients, patients, customers, they'll always come back to you. Like for me, for example, something that I do to always bring value to my clients is like whenever I have the chance, maybe I'll go like drop off donuts at their office. Like, hey, I was like thinking of you guys. Like, here you go. Here's a box of donuts. So like to the owner, like, hey, like I, I read this book. I saw this book. Um, it's like about sales and whatnot. Like I thought of you. Like I thought you'd really like it. Like here, I got it for you. Like read it. Let me know what you think. Stuff like that. I'll do it all the time. Obviously not to every single one of my clients. And when I get bigger, I won't be able to. Mm -hmm. But I try to do it to like as many of my clients as I can. And it just shows like how genuine I am. And that's what will separate me or you or whoever from anyone else is if someone else came and had greater sales skill than me, greater, better results, whatever about the results, anything, they'll think about, oh, well, Nick, whoever they like, they like actually like, they're like my friend. Like I, mm -hmm. like, I don't want to stop doing business with like my friend. And that's where you can separate. That's just one of the very small ways and small things you can do to separate yourself. So even if it does get saturated, somehow, some way, you can still always separate yourself. And like I said, these skills, you can apply them to anything. So if digital marketing, all that stuff completely dies, you could start up a whole other business and you have all these skills that aren't going to go to waste. That's not going to be a waste of time that you learn them. And the funny thing is there's like, I forget how many businesses, at least in America, are started per day. You know what I mean? It's just like yeah. there's a and abundance of business owners out there that you can talk to. Yeah, and how many have failed too, though? That's true. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> so crazy. hopefully, I mean, it's kind of hard to be like a superhero for the business if it's failing. Usually, you only want to work with clients that are already kind of doing decently well or like average, and you can get them to excellent. But like, yeah, yeah. A, bus a business that's like kind of failing or on the downturn, you don't usually want to help because then it's kind of hard <laughs> but, yeah, i mean there yeah there's exceptions to the rule where like if it's going down a little bit then you can bring them back up if you have a really good marketing campaign um kind of like i feel i feel like ihop kind of had that going on that's why they did the whole burger thing <laughs> oh yeah that's true i could see that hang on, on. But i don't know but um yeah. yeah so overall i mean is there anything else that you want to get to about that nope not that i can think of now sweet all right so yeah i appreciate you coming on nick uh if anybody wants to find you or go to your youtube channel and watch your videos or see your instagram or anything like that uh where can they find you at 
So my Instagram is at Nicholas Corvesis. Go check me out on there. If you have any questions, shoot me a DM, comment. Um, same with my YouTube. It's Nicholas Corvesis. My Facebook's Nicholas Corvesis as well. Pretty much everything's Nicholas Corvesis and my business, Corvesis Media. So, um, so yeah, Nicholas Corvesis, find me anywhere there. And Corvesis Media is my business name. If you have any questions for me, just hit me up. I'm very open. I'm available. I'd love to talk to you guys, whoever's listening to this. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on, Nick. Uh, thanks for all the value that you just gave to us. And then everybody, yeah, that, that like you said, that watched, uh, go ahead and check out Nick and uh, see what he has to offer with his valuable content on Instagram and uh, YouTube as well. And then, yeah, just appreciate you coming on, Nick. And then hopefully I will talk to you later. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I really appreciate everything. It's been cool coming on here and whatnot. But thanks again. No problem, man. I will see you later.